And I know that those of you who are married, you want your marriage to be a, like a song too, something that inspires singing. And certainly we want that kind of thing in all of our relationships as well, our friendships, even, even our relationships with acquaintances, we want them to be positive. We want them to be happy. I want my marriage to be the kind of marriage that inspires a song. And as we look into this unique book of Song of Solomon in Scripture, we get a glimpse of a couple who fell in love, and we are able to see some of the different dynamics taking place that help their marriage to be so successful. Along the way, we've seen a lot of beautiful, poetic language. Sometimes it's a little hard to understand, you know, what does this picture, but sometimes poetry is that way, isn't it? And I, and I suppose that because there's 3,000 years that separates our culture from theirs, it can be even more difficult to understand that. But we can relate that to what we are going through today, and then it starts to make sense. And we see these stunning descriptions of the emotion and the passion of their love and their relationship and their friendship and, and a little bit of honest, real life. Well, Song of Solomon doesn't pull any punches about the nature of romance and marriage and it doesn't pull any punches about an area of our relationships that we all experience. That is the area of conflict. Who here has never experienced conflict in a relationship? Oh, I better put my hand down too. We, we do, it's just part of, of the, the nature of the beast. We experience conflict. Now, it doesn't always seem very biblical, but sure enough, we find conflict even in Song of Solomon. In Song of Solomon, chapter five, open up your Bible to Song of Solomon, chapter five, and it's kind of in the middle of the Bible. You got Psalms, you have Proverbs, you have Ecclesiastes, and then Song of, pa of Solomon, sometimes known as Song, Song of Solomon, is right there, kind of in the middle. And what we see in chapter 5 is that shortly after the wedding and shortly after the honeymoon, this, this couple starts to experience some conflict. They start to experience some trouble and hardship. And here's what we read in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 through 8. Follow along with me. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew and my hair with the dampness of the night. I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. and Must I soil them again? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening, and my heart began to pound for him, and I arose to open for my lover, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city, and they beat me, and they bruised me, and they took away my cloak, those watchmen of the walls. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. This is a very interesting passage of scripture here, because it's not maybe immediately apparent, but there is conflict going on here. They are arguing, they're not getting along. And I'm not entirely sure what produced this conflict or this struggle in their relationship. He was knocking at the door, she was late in opening it, and when she did, he was gone already. He was out of there, and she couldn't find him. Now again, I don't know what caused this, scholars aren't 100% sure, but she was obviously distressed about it. So without trying to read too much into the text, let me just say a few words about conflict in marriage, or really in any relationships. It's often over something silly, isn't it? It's often over something silly. We don't know what happened in these verses to make him leave and to make her so worried, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot. It doesn't seem like much, and it rarely does. I came across a Frank and Ernest comic. You ever see the Frank and Ernest comic in the newspaper? They depicted Frank and Ernest as two angels, and they're up in heaven, and they're standing next to one another, and they're each looking at a suggestion box that's sitting on a cloud. 
And Frank says, if everybody's so happy up here, why the suggestion box? And Ernest says, because some people aren't really happy unless they can complain. <laughs> and you know, there's more truth than that than we'd like to believe, isn't there? Sometimes we argue over the silliest stuff. Sometimes we argue over the smallest things. But here's something else that's also true about conflict in marriage. It hurts more. You know, the closer your relationship, the more it hurts. Sometimes it's those little things that are said or done, or, or those little things that aren't said or done in marriage that hurt more than you might expect because this is your best friend, right? This is your closest confidant. And I think sometimes we just kind of expect the other person to be able to read our mind, or we're, we're supposed to read their mind, and that always inevitably leads to trouble. Even little things seem to hurt because you love the person so much. But here's another observation about conflict in marriage. Sometimes we overreact. overreact. <laughs> Maybe I need to rephrase that. Maybe it's all the time we overreact. I don't know if that's true for you or not, but for a lot of people it is, right? Sometimes we overreact. And in marital conflict, overreaction, it just leads to so many more problems. Maybe it's because we feel like we're safe in a committed marriage, and, and so we just kind of let unfiltered anger and sarcasm take over. Or maybe it's because we know the other person so well, we have all kinds of ammunition to shoot at them, right? And, and so we overreact. The only problem with that is you can't take it back. When we overreact, we can't take it back. Sure, things can heal over, right? But it's like pulling a nail out of a piece of wood. There's still going to be a scar there. And sometimes that's how it is in our hearts and in our lives. Sometimes we overreact to our spouse because we tend to be attracted to that which is opposite of what we are. And in the beginning, that seems great. But later on, sometimes not so much. You probably heard people say before, opposites attract, right? I, I think I believe that that is true. In fact, how many marriages do you know where one person is unorganized and messy and the other person is much more structured and, and uh, organized? Or maybe one person's a night owl and the other person's an early bird, right? Or maybe one person is loud and outgoing and the other person more quiet and reserved? And, and we see that in our relationships over and over again. We're very different. And when two very different people get married, it is only a matter of time before conflicts start to arise. And I think what we need to do is try to look at things a little bit differently, from a different perspective. Different isn't always bad. I remember one wife commenting how she was so mad at her husband because instead of sweeping the kitchen floor with a broom, he went around with the vacuum and sucked everything up. Well, that's just a little bit of a difference of opinion, right? Different isn't necessarily bad, it's just different. And so, what if we were able to see things from a different perspective? What if you were able to look at it as God gave you the spouse that you have who is so much more different from you, not because he wants to make you unhappy, but because he wants you to be holy. He wants you to be mature. He wants you to be complete. That's why God gave you a spouse who's so different from you. Paul writes in Ephesians that we need to be humble and gentle with one another, making room for one another's differences because of our love. And he goes on to say in Ephesians that when we don't deal with conflict in a healthy way, it gives the devil a foothold. And sometimes that's all the devil needs is a foothold, right? To just wreak havoc in our life and in our relationships and our marriage. Here's what I think we get from Song of Solomon chapter 5. Every marriage has conflict. Even this one that we write about in Song of Solomon chapter 5. It's just the reality when you have two people who are human beings and they're living with each other over much time. There will inevitably be conflict. Fighting in marriage doesn't mean that you're failing. It doesn't mean that your marriage is doomed or that it's falling apart. It just means you're in a marriage. But there are a couple of key differences between good fighting and bad fighting. Good arguing and bad arguing. See, every marriage is going to have conflict. There's, there's no doubt about that. So I don't 
want to ever, ever say to you that you should never, ever fight. What, what I do want to talk about with you, though, this morning is how to fight, how to argue, how to communicate. See, we would say, I'm sure if I asked you, what, are, what is the most important key to making a, a, a marriage good? Probably 90% of you would say, good communication. But so often we don't communicate in ways that are good. And that's really what we're talking about today. See, conflict can kill your marriage or it can strengthen your marriage. And the difference often hinges on how you handle the conflict that inevitably arises, and it always will. There will be conflict in your marriage. It's not a matter of if there's ever conflict. It's a matter of when there's conflict, will you handle it appropriately? Now, I know that whenever we do a marriage series at the church or in our life groups, through the years, people will sometimes say, and I've heard this in various forms, they'll say, I don't like it when you do these series, because it just seems like every time we do that, I end up having more problems in my marriage afterwards. Or, you know, they'll, they'll say something like, you know, I always like what we're studying, but, but I always feel discouraged because things go good for a little while, and then we just kind of revert back to our old patterns. But what I realize is that it isn't the marriage stuff we're talking about that makes marriage is rocky. We've either refused to talk about it, those issues in our life. You know, there's already stuff there. And maybe we're just not talking about it. We're not dealing with it in a constructive way. And so sometimes these issues we talk about in church, they make us uncomfortable, don't they? But that can be good, actually. It depends on what you do with God's Word and how you put these principles for having a strong marriage that we talk about into your life. And they need repeating. In fact, Craig and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, that we need to do something like this at least once a year because we are people of habit and we, we need to hear these things brought out more and more again until they become like second nature to us. That's just how we are as people. And these principles are true of any close relationship. Marriage is the easy one to talk about because it's the one that's more intimate. It's the one that's often more stressful. <laughs> But the truth is, it's just, it's just a close friendship, one in which you are living together. So in your marriage and in your closest friendships, here are a few key ways to handle conflict so that it will strengthen your relationship and doesn't kill it. The first key in handling conflict while in your marriage, it seems pretty common sense, but we need to say it, commit to the relationship. That's the first key. Commit to the relationship when you are experiencing struggle in your marriage. Now you're probably thinking, you know, I'm already married, that's why I'm fighting. <laughs> but here's what I mean. Having conflict in marriage, it's okay. As long as it's clear that you're committed to the good of the marriage, not taking advantage to fulfill your own self-centered agenda. Because what I know to be true is that if your spouse knows that you care more about the marriage and you care more about their soul than just being right, it will change the whole tone of the conflict. And if you care more about the marriage than being right, it not only helps the conflict come to an end in a better way, it's actually going to reduce the amount of conflict that's in your relationship. And in Ephesians chapter 5, in Paul's famous passage on marriage, he said that husbands need to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. And he said that wives need to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. Now that does not mean that wives obey or give in to every single thing their husband does or says. What it means is that the two responsibilities work hand in hand. The wife submits to the husband because he loves her in a Christ-like way, and the husband loves his wife selflessly because he knows that she will respect him in a way that will help their marriage to succeed. The two, they work in tandem. And just before that, Paul says, in Ephesians 5.21, he says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says that to all Christians. So the same principle that guides all Christians in interacting with one another that principle of submitting to one another in order to glorify Jesus, it applies to husbands and wives who are interacting with each other, and they need to submit to each other out of a desire to see their marriage succeed and Jesus to be glorified. So I just want to ask you right now, 
What would change in the way you handle conflict with your spouse if you truly cared more about the health and the thriving of your marriage than about being right or getting your own way? How would, how would that conflict and that communication change? Answer honestly. Don't be pointing fingers in your head right now to the other person either. Well, if he would do this, if she'd do that. You see, it's not about what the other person needs to do differently. Really, it's about what you need to do differently. It's about what I need to do differently. Because the fact of the matter is, you and I can never control another person. Do you realize that? Do you accept that? You can never control another person. You can only control yourself. And you either feel good about that or not so good. Conflict in marriage can help a marriage thrive if it's more about the marriage than about the self-centeredness in each spouse. And if you can agree on those terms of engagement, it can change everything about how your conflict is handled. And it also reduces those times that a conflict erupts over something that's just silly and stupid. If it's about you and not the good of the marriage, then it's not worth fighting about. To be clear, this isn't to say that abuse in any form ought to go unnoticed or unmentioned. Abuse is a whole other category. That absolutely is an issue for the good of the marriage. And if you're in an abusive situation, don't keep quiet because you're trying to pursue the good of the marriage or put your own personal needs to the side. A marriage cannot thrive in those conditions and it does need to be brought to light and it does need to be handled appropriately. So that's not what we're talking about, but we are talking about being committed to your relationship, right? Being committed to your marriage. Well, the second key in fighting fair in your marriage is to apologize first. Sometimes that apology is over big things, sometimes it's over little things. We already said that overreaction tends to be an issue in marriage, and I think one of the biggest reasons why we overreact is that we bottle up those little things until we get to the last straw, and then poof, everything explodes, right? That's never good. Now there are tons of things that my wife does or says that, that uh, might bother me from time to time, and I'm sure the same is true for her, probably more so towards me, you know? But that's just what it means to be a human being. Over time, when I come to realize what I've done is not appreciated by her, I need to be the one who, in a Christ-like way, is willing to apologize first. I don't tell her, deal with it. You know? I, I don't hope she doesn't notice. I, I don't, I, what I need to do is apologize for not submitting myself to her needs. I need to apologize, maybe, for not handling the situation appropriately. Sometimes it's those little things, not the bigger things. And it's so hard to be the first one to apologize. But it's one of the most important things you can do for a thriving marriage. Pursuing the good of the marriage means that you are so concerned with the health of the marriage and the soul of your spouse and the good of your spouse that you humble yourself to make that apology happen. You don't wait to get caught. You don't try to win the argument. You don't bring up the past. You know, sometimes we get historical in our arguments, don't we? I'm not saying hysterical. Yeah, we get hysterical too, but a lot of times we get historical, right? We bring up the past and we throw it at him as a little bomb. And we need to stop that kind of stuff. Don't try to excuse your behavior because of theirs. Don't give them the silent treatment. Talk it out. Share your feelings. Apologize if you need to. Those two little words, I'm sorry can save so much heartache and so much loneliness and so much stress and so many angry words that you can't take back. I really appreciated the devotion from this last Thursday's Our Daily Bread. I don't know if you've read it or not or if you read those. We do give those away for free, by the way. They're out on the entryway table. <clears throat> but last Thursday's entry was by an author named Jennifer Schultz, and she told of the time when she was driving with her two kids in the car. You, you must have read this. After about a half hour in the car, all of a sudden her daughter suddenly starts wailing in the back seat. Then mom asks what happened, and she says her brother grabbed her arm. Well, he claims that he grabbed her arm because she pinched him. 
And then she says she pinched him because he said something mean. And that's just kind of how these little skirmishes get started, isn't it? And we laugh at that, and it's sort of cute in kids when you're not going through it at the time. But unfortunately, handle disagreements. Sometimes it's how we as adults handle disagreements, and then it's not so cute. One person offends the other. The hurt person shoots back a verbal blow. The original offender retaliates with an insult, and before long, anger and harsh words have just totally damaged the relationship. But you know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, Peter says this of Jesus. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And I love that. Just think how much drama and relational pain could be avoided if we were willing to take on that kind of attitude that Jesus had and say, I'm sorry when we messed up or when we said something offensive or did something hurtful to our spouse. Look back at Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 8. Look at verse 8. She was looking for her husband, couldn't find him to make things right, and she says she was faint with love. And in poetical uh, language up above that, it talks about her being bruised, you know. Sometimes we feel beat up when we are in arguments, right? Emotionally. But she says she's faint with love. And isn't that what happens when we're not getting along with one another? We kind of feel faint with love. We, we kind of feel like we're exhausted and you can't think of anything else and it's hard to work because things just aren't right with you and your spouse. And when we choose to live with bitterness and when we are always trying to win the argument and pursuing our own desires, we create an environment within marriage that it just produces stress and anxiety and anger and bitterness and unrest and, and we become faint with love. It takes a lot of courage and humility to apologize first, but it takes a bigger toll on your heart if you <laughs> choose to live with unresolved conflict in your marriage because of pride and selfishness. Well, there's one more key to mention here this morning about conflict in our closest relationships, and it might sound kind of ridiculous, but hear me out. We need to do nice to each other. Do nice to each other. Now, I know that typically that's not how we state that thought. Typically we say, be nice to each other. And that's fine. I get it. <laughs> but as I think about it, to me it just seems too passive. It's like we're going to wait for somebody else to be nice to us and then we'll in turn do something nice for them. But that's not what doing nice to one another is all about. We are to do nice to each other. It is active. It's a verb. It's something we do first. It's something we do always. It's something we are consistent in. Now you might ask yourself, well, of course I'm going to do nice to others. Why does he even bring this up? It's kind of a given. Of course I'm going to be nice to my spouse. I am always nice to my spouse, but are you really? Are you really? See, sometimes we think we are, and we don't even realize how we're coming across to each other. Think about, think about it like this. When you fight with your best friend, or maybe somebody who's outside of your family, what's your tone like? Not their tone, but yours. You ever focus on that? How do you talk to them? What kinds of words do you use? Do you ever belittle them, either you know, explicitly or subtly? How much sarcasm do you use? Do you cuss them out? Do you raise your voice? See, this issue isn't as easy and simple as it sounds at first, because I'm convinced that a lot of our problems in our fights in marriage, it stems from the small, easily handled discussions that blow up simply because we're just not nice to each other. Maybe we catastrophize or we create a lot of drama because we think that's somehow going to be more interesting or that's how things should go or that that's what we need to do to get the other person's attention, right? And we just kind of set our manners off to the side and we lay into them. We say, well, this is just who I am. You need to accept me for that. Or we think, I'm in my own home. It's okay if I just let my hair down and say it like it is. Well, I want to enlighten you with the Bible's perspective on that attitude. And I want you to pay very close attention, because I'm going to get really theological, and I don't want you to miss it. 
In fact, I'm hoping that it's not so theological that you miss this. So here goes. I'm going to try my best to put this theology in a way that you can understand. If you think it's okay to get all red-faced and just verbally vomit all over the people you care about when you're upset with them, here's the Bible's perspective on that. Blowing. Isn't that theological? Do you get that? In fact, say it with me. Baloney. <coughs> if you get this little bit of biblical the theology regarding how to work through relationship problems, <coughs> it'll make a huge difference in your life, and it'll make a huge difference in your marriage and friendships. Because who says that when you have disagreements, you have to have raised voices? Who says that when you have problems, you have to all of a sudden make the other person feel bad? Who says that you have to, some, for some reason, always be the one who comes out on top, right? Who says that it's okay to hurt their feelings and knock them down? My friends, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, I know that the word baloney is a too theological sounding, so let me just kind of... Let me just quote from the Bible and what it says about having a Christian character in all of our relationships. Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So here's what you can do to fight more fairly and to do nice to one another in the process. Use those character traits as a filter when you're in disagreement with your spouse. Think, is what I'm about to say a fruit of the Spirit? I, I think we'd all be amazed at how much less tense our disagreements would be if we apply that filter to our words and attitudes. So if you can agree to pursue the good of the relationship, because you're committed to it, and not to your own selfish desires, if you can humble yourself and be the first one to apologize, and if you can do nice to each other, truly be nice and kind and gentle and self-controlled when you speak and act, the conflict in your closest relationships, it will change drastically. And here's why that matters so much. Because what we're talking about this morning, it isn't so much self about self-help. It's not about, here's three steps to a happier life. This isn't about personal fulfillment. In fact, which of these three keys to fighting fair sounds like personal fulfillment? Which of these three keys sounds happy? The truth is, they are. But my friends, it doesn't matter. Because marriage isn't about you. It's not even about happiness. It's not about self-fulfillment. It's about learning to sacrifice and learning to be selfless, <clears throat> learning to give up your desires, learning to serve someone else, learning to be humble, learning to truly love with your actions, not just your words. That's why the passage we mentioned earlier from Ephesians 5 is so key when it comes to marriage. It's not about making you happy. It's about reflecting the kind of love that Jesus has for us. It's about giving yourself up for the good of someone else. It's about letting the Holy Spirit change you so that you speak words that are kind instead of words that are angry and cutting. It's about being winsome, not whining. And when we do those things, we let Jesus be reflected more and more in us. When we learn sacrifice and humility and kindness in the way we interact with each other, we learn to be like Jesus. And when we act like Jesus in our marriages, people begin to notice that it sounds a whole lot less like yelling and a whole lot more like a beautiful song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you praise and thanksgiving for your word and for the principles that it establishes about relationships that can be successful and healthy and happy. And we know that our relationships that we have in life, they are one of the, the most joyful things that, that bring fulfillment. But we understand, Lord, that it's about more than just that. It's about being in relationship to you, and it's about being 
the, the life of Christ to other people. And it needs to begin in our homes, with our spouses, with our children, with our family, and go out from there. And that's not always easy, Lord. So help us to be humble. Help us to love you first. And knowing that we are doing what's right, we will be happy in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.